I'm Matt Lewis of the Center for Public Integrity. In this piece on the road lobby, I decided to travel to Florida. It's a state that's thrived on its own growth, so it's no surprise that groups are engaged in transportation lobbying back in Washington, as the center's mapping indicates. Policy's at a crossroads right now because the system keeps running low on funding, and to raise new money, the nation needs to agree to a vision. In Florida, that's doubly important because it's having to siphon its state transportation funds to address budget shortfalls. You've got a number of firms in the state that are engaged and are really the members of what you might refer to as the federal road lobby. Their unemployment rates have shot up, private capitals dwindled, and they've been relying on public dollars, including the stimulus, just to stay afloat. At the same time, there's other groups and local leaders who believe the way the federal government spends those transportation dollars needs to dramatically change. But until there's the political will to address the deflating federal gas tax, there could be something of a power struggle at a time where the lobby really needs to be united. This is a highway in West Palm Beach. I drove up there last month because I wanted to speak to the people who build them. When I got there, I met with a pair of South Florida road builders, Ranger Construction, an affiliate of one of the nation's largest transportation builders, and Community Asphalt, a subsidiary of the Spanish infrastructure firm, OHL Group. Both have laid off a large share of their workforce during the recession, but were able to save dozens of additional jobs, thanks to projects that were at least partially funded by the economic stimulus bill. They're both incredibly concerned, though, about developments playing out in the state capitol and in Washington. Community Asphalt just started working on its $559 million project with two other firms, located at the interchange of two major expressways near the Miami airport. It should save them between 50 and 100 jobs. And when I drove into the site on a Thursday afternoon, it was a complete mess. I was coming from the top right of the screen, and this is what it looked like as I approached. It's definitely a critical interchange, and construction on this was just started, so there's years to go. But you can see some of the preliminary work there in the distance. Now, these companies belong to a variety of industry groups that can be affiliated with what we've labeled the Road Gang which is also the name of a long-time informal fraternity of transportation officials and builders and lobbyists and others here in Washington. They're traditionally some of the major policy players, the American Road and Transportation Builders Association, the National Asphalt Pavement Association. These are some examples. The unions spend millions in partnership with them, and there are plenty of others. But firms like Ranger and Community and their employees are really the group's grassroots members. That guy in the distance is Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood. This photo from the National Bike Summit wouldn't normally merit much attention, but his surprise tabletop speech at the event swept over the web and got plenty of play in the last few weeks. It was really when LaHood wrote on his blog shortly after the speech that the dust was kicked up, because his post announced what he referred to as a sea change in policy that would mark the end of favoring motorized travel at the expense of non-motorized. And some of the heavyweight lobbying groups in Washington were pretty quick to protest that notion. I headed to downtown Miami because I wanted to speak to South Florida Bike Coalition Director Catherine Moore, who was at that summit. First in the Miami mayor's office and now at her new job, Moore's taken advantage of street closures and block parties to talk to citizens about their local roads. And many of the concerns she has pertaining to complete streets have a lot of support right now amongst policymakers in Washington. The premier advocacy group for this movement is Transportation for America. One of their recent reports actually called out many of Florida's major metro areas for being the most dangerous for pedestrians due to their average death rates. This Fort Lauderdale intersection is a perfect example of what I saw in South Florida that differed from what I'm used to both driving and walking in Washington. The pedestrians were generally confused by the walk light not automatically coming up, and they would hesitate or maybe make it about halfway across. The size of these intersections is also an issue for Moore's group. She brought up a recent bike ride in Coral Springs, which is a Broward suburb pictured here. This is an example of one intersection at Atlantic and University. As you can see, there are bike lanes on the road, but what Moore mentioned was the difficulty in crossing by foot or going left on bike. I definitely didn't see many folks trying to do either one. Now, transportation policy in Florida hasn't just been about roads lately. High-speed rail champions were ecstatic a few months ago when the administration came down to announce more than a billion dollars for a route from Tampa to Orlando 
that they planned on eventually connecting to South Florida. To get that money, the state really needed to renew its support for commuter rail. This is one of the South Florida tri-rail stations in Broward County, and this is the train. It runs along I-95, so there's not always a lot of development around the stations, but this is an example of one station, Boca Raton, that has it. The train runs north-south across three counties and connects to Miami's elevated metro rail. In downtown Fort Lauderdale, I went to talk to Greg Stewart, the director of the Broward Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is tasked with making long-range transportation plans. I was interested because his office's latest vision was wildly different from past reports. They published the public comments they received on where to go next, and the overwhelming response was for transit and more options. A lot of this is naturally because Broward can't really expand outward, so Stewart is now spending a lot of his time all over the county talking about dedicated lanes for what's called bus rapid transit, which looks a lot like light rail but on wheels and cheaper. He could do the rail, but that would take a lot more money, so Stewart's trying to demonstrate to people just what they could get for the amount they're already paying. Concerns about livability and more options for citizens using the system have been in line with what the Obama administration has been focused on for the last year. But the groups that build and operate the network or use it to move goods are wary that these efforts won't pay for themselves. And their argument comes back to the Highway Trust Fund, which only has about half the purchasing power it did in 1993 when the federal gas tax was last adjusted. Their position is basically that livability is great, but America has a large enough crisis on its hands when it comes to maintaining economic competitiveness. They tend to argue that focusing intently on livability should be a local concern. Of course, there's much more to the debate, but the basic fact is that until these groups can convince the public to trust Washington to raise new money, you'll hear a lot more about the struggle for funds that are available. If you've made it this far, thanks. And I'd encourage you to take a look around the project to see a few of the other ways groups in your area are lobbying on transportation policy. There are plenty of local stories to be told, and our web team has done a tremendous job of visualizing the data, whether in this story on nationwide development interests or in this piece on high-speed rail lobbying. Thanks for listening.